This has been a challenging series, so before we begin, let's just welcome everyone who may be watching online or listening to the podcast, or if it's your first time or first time in a while, thank you for joining us. We're in a series called Forward, and this is week four, and this has been a challenging series which is designed to grow us as a person, as people. It's here to help you grow as a person. There are some messages that are more, mainly inspirational, and then there are some that are more transformational. And these messages are mainly transformational with a little bit of inspiration sprinkled in there so that you don't get too bored and fall asleep, right? <laughs> so uh, we looked at the difference between a believer and a disciple, and I'm not going to review it all, but we have these characteristics of what a disciple looks like. And it's important for us to know that so that we can be that kind of a person, Uh, We talk about not playing the church game. We don't want to just come, sing Christian songs, go home, and try to do better. And the only way we're going to do that is if we are aware of what God expects of us and make sure that we are moving towards being a disciple. So the first week, we talked about how a disciple's passionately, keyword passionately, committed to Christ. We're not bored. We're not just kind of like, ho-hum, this is my thing. We're excited about it. How many of you excited about Jesus this morning? Three of you are. How about the rest of you? You excited about Jesus, right? Okay, we're going to have a thing for Parker afterward so we can do all our crying then. So for these few minutes, I need you engaged, right? All right, we'll be able to do all that. Secondly, a disciple has an extraordinary love for people. And the only way you can have this love is by having the Holy Spirit, God's Holy Spirit living in you. We can't love people the way they're supposed to be loved without that. Thirdly, we need to have the heart of a servant, and uh, we kind of hit that hard last week, and this week's going to even be more fun. We have been challenged. Have you been challenged by this series? I've been challenged by it. This is it. This, in fact, this week is probably the number one reason this topic is why people aren't in the seats. They, they check out of church. That's why I'm so excited about it. And this characteristic of a disciple is that they live morally pure. Morally pure. There's another old-fashioned word. See, we have to use new, fresh words for people that are coming up, and they're like, oh, morally pure. Yeah, I get that. Well, see, back in the day, they called it holiness, which is a term that a lot of us are like, oh, no, (laughs) holiness, boring, but uh, holiness is not boring. It actually puts you in a position to be used by God. Check this out. Your average teenager today thinks it's more morally wrong to not recycle than it is to watch porn. Did you hear that? Your average teenager would say, you'd, he'd be more upset than you'd think that you're, you're morally worse for not recycling than if you were watching porn. Where has the church failed in presenting the gospel and the truth of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ where people think it's okay to do certain things and think that that's all right, that that's what a disciple is all about? I told you we're going to be challenging this morning. I know we're going to light it up. You ready? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Some of us know the scripture. Some of us maybe have never heard it before. Don't you know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, or slanderers, or swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And what do we do in church? We rank sin. Well, that right over there, that sin is really worse than my sin. And let me tell you something, we have no right to rank sin. We have no place, we have no platform to stand on. We're all redeemed, bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. Every one of us needs redemption from being a sinner or someone that sins by nature. And we have no right to rank sin. It needs to to exit our vocabulary. We don't need to think about it. Uh, in certain in those terms anymore because there's people that go well, you know I know those folks uh, that are doing that over there they're not going to make it but what about the person that bums off their friend's Netflix Netflix account 
right? What about people who clock into work and don't work? We don't want to talk about them, but we want to talk about the porn watchers and the homosexuals and things like that. Get all over their case while we're doing what we're doing, right? Verse 11 is the key part of this scripture. That is what some of you were. Everybody say were. Right, that's what I was. I was one. I was a thief. I was an idolater. I was greedy. I may have been a homosexual. It doesn't matter. Whatever it was that you were, God has made it. That's what we mean when we talk about a transformation has happened on the inside of you. You were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Did you hear that? You've been washed, sanctified, justified. Amen. That's what I am. And that's what you are. Check out this scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. To the church of God in Corinth. Now, let's just kind of bring that home for a second. The Corinth was just a city that Paul had been to where he started a church, and he was writing a letter to the church that he started. It really wouldn't matter where that church is. So you could say, to the church of God in Chicago, to the church of God in Texas, or the church of God in Griffin, Georgia. Or you could even say, to, the Wood to Woodland Church. It's talking to you and me this morning. To those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people. Sanctified is just a big fancy word for being made holy, set apart. And we're called to be his holy people together with all those everywhere who call in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and our. Now see, the problem we have a lot of times as Christians is we try to ride this line between grace and holiness. We think grace is just the fact that we're going to be forgiven if we sin. Even though we are going to be forgiven if we sin, we think that grace is just a continual living there. That's the difference between a believer and a disciple. A believer was okay with living forgiven. A disciple wants to live holy. Did you hear that? A believer is okay with living forgiven. But a disciple wants to be holy. Oh, I did it again. Forgive me, Lord. Oh, I did it again. Forgive me, Lord. No real change. No real purpose. No, there's a difference. That's a, you can be a believer. You can live forgiven. But you're not going to be used by God like you can when you live a holy life. A disciple may be, they may be going, you know, God, I understand that, that, that this is something that you don't like in my life. And I purpose, I'm moving in the direction towards holiness. I know I may stumble, but I'm moving towards you, God. I'm headed towards the light. I'm headed towards living morally pure. I'm going to be an example. This is not going to stay in my life. That's a disciple talking. The problem is when we talk about purity, this is what people think of. We have a picture uh, that I thought everyone might appreciate. A picture of what we're talking about when people think of pure, purity. I won't get it. There they are. Right? These are Puritans. Notice how unhappy they are. Right? And I think that's a, a lady on the left-hand side. I'm not really sure. This guy has a beard. Do they look like they're enjoying life? See, that's what they think of. This is what people think the church is like. This. We don't have any fun. We don't do anything. We don't like each other. We just, in their idea of entertainment is reading the Bible and praying. That's what they do for fun. We do read the Bible and pray. It's a Christian discipline. But that's not necessarily what we do for fun. Of course, Puritans don't have fun. They just don't do it, right? So the question is, am I made holy or am I called to live holy? And the answer is yes. You've been made holy, and because you've been made holy, you are called to live holy. We need to get, so I just want to give you a few things to help us walk in purity. Number one, we need to get a vision for holiness. Too often, holiness is presented as you better do this and you can't do that. That's the way I grew up. I grew up in the holiness situation. We couldn't dance, we couldn't um, drink, we couldn't smoke, we couldn't have sex with people before marriage, all the things the Bible says you shouldn't do, I mean, plus a few, they, they added to it. Uh, and all of that, as a teenager, meant I can't have any fun. My neighbor was Catholic, he could do whatever he wanted, and just went to Mass, and could, I'm serious, 
That was my perception of it. And, and I know, and I'm not trying to, to, to throw Catholics under the bus because I, they're very devout people. And, and I'm not trying to say that's what all of them think. But that was my impression of my Catholic neighbor. The guy can do whatever he wants. I can't do anything. That's what holiness was. But see, that's the wrong picture. That's the wrong vision of holiness. Proverbs 29 says, 29, 18 says this, when there's no vision, the people cast off restraint. This is, how it, this is how it plays out in church. See, in a home, when mom and dad says, do this, you're like, why? And they're like, because I said so. Right? So what do you do? As soon as you leave the room, your kid does it. Because that is not a good enough reason to tell them why not to do it. So when we go to church, we hear, be holy. People go, why? Why should I be holy? First of all, we need to be holy because God is holy. Right? God said, be holy for I am holy. And here's, I want you to hear this from a different perspective this morning. See, a lot of times holiness and purity is presented as don't, 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 don't. And we don't give each other reasons why. God is your father. And I'll tell you something that most any parent would have to admit uh, if they're going to be honest, and that is as your kids grow up and you are a parent, you begin to see the things in their life or in their character or in their, uh, their personality, whatever it is, that you struggled with. And you thought, oh, my word, they got that. That really created problems for me growing up, and now they have that same issue. No parent wants to pass along any negative characteristics. Am I right? They want their children to get all the good stuff. If we had a filter, I, I, if there was some way I could filter it out, I'd go, okay, they're just going to get all the positive stuff, like a superhuman. But here's the thing. God doesn't have any bad characteristics. And God is just like any other father, and he wants all of his children to have his characteristics. The thing is, they're all good. So when he says, be holy like I'm holy, he's really saying, be like me. I have all these good characteristics, and I want you to have them all. I'm not angry with you. I'm not upset with you. And I'm going to tell you why. When you're like me, the, the world sees me in you. Right? 1 Peter 1.14, As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. So that you look like your heavenly father and you have his characteristics. Secondly, we need, we're called to be holy to set us apart so that we're different. We're not called to be ninja Christians. Sneaking around in the world, looking just like them, talking just like them, acting just like them. So that someone knows you for years and they're like, gosh, I never knew you were a believer. That's not a compliment. Hello? Now, we can go to the other ditch and just be rude and weird. We don't want to do that. But we need to take a stand. And let me tell you something. If you follow God wholeheartedly, you're not going to look like the world around you. Jesus is a great example of that. When he was here, we talked about it a couple of weeks ago. He's at Matthew's house. And who showed up? The riffraff. We don't like the riffraff. I actually talked to one of my, uh, a neighbor of mine, and he said, I'm in this part of the neighborhood here because I don't want to be around the riffraff. He said that to me. He's like, I'm trying to get away from the riffraff. Jesus wasn't trying to get away from the riffraff. When they showed up, he wasn't like, I don't know. Time for me to make my exit. He wasn't put off by them, but you know what? He wasn't one of them either. He was different. And guess what? When people are struggling, when the riffraff are struggling inside, see, God knows what's going on inside of us. When they're struggling and they see someone that's different and their, their life is happy and they're pure and they're like, hey, I want that. But if you look just like them, talk just like them, act just like them, they're, they're going to be, well, why should I join your group? Why should I follow what you're following? I'm, I can already have all that crap without it without Jesus. And you're like, well, maybe we need to do a better job of presenting Jesus to the world. We also are available. See, Jesus was available to God to, for God to use him in power. If there's one thing we lack in the body of Christ, it's the power of God in our lives. 
And the reason we don't have power of God in our lives is because we're playing patty cake with sin. We pet it. We make excuses for it. We live with it. We make justification for it. We compare ourselves to other people. And all to make ourselves feel better when God is like, I can't cohabitate with that. I can't live with that. I can't use that. I can't do that. I'm holy. I want you to be pure, not impure. Not never make a mistake. That's not what we mean. We mean a life of living pure before God. We need to look different. First, or Philippians 2, 14 says, do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault and warped in a crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. See, that's what God wants. So when, the, when the believers walk in the room, there's something in the room that people can tell is different. Right? We need to shine in the world that we live in. And just imagine for a second a world or a, just a church, let's just say a church where nobody was grumbling or complaining. Is there such a thing? But isn't that what this verse is telling us to do? Do everything, everything, everything without grumbling or complaining. How many of you have missed it in this area? I have guilty, right? But that doesn't mean that's not my goal. Thirdly, we're called to live holy to protect us from our enemy. You see, we, we, have to, we need to get a, our thinking straight when it comes to sin. Sin is not our friend. If it wasn't for sin, we wouldn't have made it through the tough times. Sin was there by my side, helping me make it through. No, Jesus was there by your side, helping you make it through the tough times. Sin's our enemy. It needs to be treated like our enemy. How many of you have learned this? Satan works both sides of the sin door. <laughs> I love what Ravi, Ravi Zacharias said. You need to hear this. Sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. Isn't that the truth? When sin calls to you, it says, listen, it's okay. No one else is doing it. No one's going to know about it. Every, or no, it doesn't say no one else is doing it. It says everyone else is doing it. It's all right. God will forgive you. Go ahead. And you ever notice sin always wants you in the moment? It never looks down the road. It's always trying to get you to sell your future for instant gratification. And God's the opposite. He's saying, don't sacrifice my plan and purpose for your life to get involved in this moment of pleasure or moment of sin. We need to hear this, right? Yeah. Satan works both sides of the sin door. He tempts you going in, and when you're going out, once you've yielded, once you sin, what's he do? Oh, man, you've done it now. God will never forgive you. you might, you're in a nosedive now. Nobody's going to think the same of you. Nobody, oh, nobody's as bad as you. You're in a spiral. You're headed down, and you're never going to come out of it. You might, as well just, you might as well just go for it all the way. Just get all the way in. Don't just dabble in it. Bury yourself in it. You might as well. You're not coming out of it. Work in both sides. People don't even know it. God told this to Cain. He said, sin is crouching at your door, but you must master it. Amen. I got a video that I found. This is a great illustration of what happens to people and how they end up getting devoured by the enemy. Is it going to be back there? Let's go. Here's these two gazelles, and what are they doing? They're fighting, and I like the ones in the foreground here. They're like, wait, something's going on back there. Check it out. Oh, what, what is it? Lion, 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 <laughs> right? They're the ones with their heads up. They're the ones that are looking around. But the two that are fighting, focused on themselves, what's happening? We're not going to get graphic. They're going to end it. It's over, Right? That's what happens to us when we get focused on the wrong thing. 
We fight with each other. We're in this. We're buried. We're, we're, our heads are down. We're not looking up. We're not listening to the people around us. We're engaged in all this, and we get devoured. Satan's crouching. He's right there. <laughs> we, we, we've, we've exchanged. Oh, wait a minute here. Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. When we talk about purity, that's the end game. That's the goal, to see God. You don't see God and be pure. We've exchanged seeing God for watching porn and walking with Jesus for popping a bottle. We're looking to all kinds of things that are around us to satisfy something that can only be satisfied by our relationship with Jesus. Only God can fill that. Only God can change that. No amount of alcohol or any other thing that we engage in that's not ungodly is going to help us through our problem. It's not going to fix the problem. We may feel better for a moment. I know this is a great message this morning. I know y'all are just like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> Some of the old holiness people are like, yeah. <laughs> We're not trying to get anybody this morning because we're going to bring this around to where we are going to help you out of this because this is the one thing that caused me to disengage from church. I heard all these things about what I wasn't supposed to do. Sin is bad and stay away from it and all this and how much God hated it. And I was like, I don't want to do it because God hates it. I don't want to please, I don't want to, I don't want to uh, uh, disappoint God. But no one told me how to overcome it. Without that, Where's the message? We can't just leave people in the dark going, you can't. We got to tell them what's, what God has done and what you have. Secondly, we need to empty our lives of evil. I'll try to get through these as quickly as I can. We have to compare our sin to God, not other people's sin. Sometimes it just takes coming to yourself. You know the story of the prodigal son. He longed, Luke 15, 16, he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating. But no one gave him anything. It's a Jewish guy. And we're supposed to eat pork. He's in there with the pigs. Had to be disgusting for him. You know what? He came to himself. What am I doing? And sometimes the kindest thing that God can do for us and to us is when we're not listening and when we refuse to cooperate and when we are not going to follow him, he just lets us go all the way to the end until we find come to ourselves. if that's what it's going to take now just hear me for a second we never want to pray any kind of tragedy on anyone you know I've had people say you know I got a, a loved one that's not walking with God and I just pray that God does whatever we don't pray that God hurts people but if we won't listen to God and we won't obey God and he tries several ways and we're just like, I will not, I will not, I will not, he will let you come to yourself. And that's a gift from God. If you're there, if you're coming to yourself going, what have I done or what am I doing? Thank God for that. This is a day that you can end that part of your life and you can transition to moving forward into a new life of becoming a disciple. Secondly, we need to bring the sin into the light. It involves a, a difficult word, confession. See, we know if we confess to God, he's for, going to forgive us, and sometimes that's a little easier. But when we talk about confession, there's this scripture in James that says, therefore confess your sins to each other, pray for each other that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. See, this is why we've been talking about community so much, community groups. When you get into a community group and you have a relationship with someone that can actually, and it takes a little while, you don't go into a community group first week, spill your guts and tell all this stuff. That's not what we're asking you to do. No one does that. What we're saying is when you actually get real enough with someone, the mask comes off and you're finally like, okay, I'm tired of trying to talk church and play church even when I'm not at church. I'm here with people who know me. They know what's going on in my life and they can speak reality to me. You can finally say, what am I doing? And someone else can actually say that to you. What are you doing? 
And not from the perspective of condemnation, but to say, listen, there's people that love you. We're here to pray for you. We're here to help you. We're here to help you come out of it. I had that same problem, and I overcame. And let me show you what the Lord did for me. I'm here to pray for you. But what are you doing? We can't live here. This is not where we live as believers, as disciples. Right? We don't want to stay there. But sometimes we've got to bring it into the light. I told you kind of briefly uh, about the last few years of my life, five, six years. I was just, I've been under some intense pressure, uh, mainly in the area of just wanting to quit and giving up. It seemed like when I went home, uh, Satan sat on me, and it was a bombardment of thoughts. Give up, quit, just forget it. All the negatives of, about being in the ministry were always in the forefront of my mind. And I got to the point where I was like, you know what, God, I'd just as soon be gone. I really don't like this. And if I was out of here, meaning in heaven with you, then it'd be, I'd feel better. Those thoughts were coming to my mind. I'm a pastor preaching the truth, word of faith, victory, and I'm bombarded. And I found a friend who I could tell, see, here's one of the reasons we don't like to confess to other people, because we think the moment we say something to somebody, they're going to think less of me. And that keeps us in isolation. Those two deer, or gazelles, isolated. That's where Satan pounces. When you're away from the herd, everyone else is going, I'm out of here. I'm not going to get involved in that stuff. And you're there. Because you can't tell anybody. I couldn't tell anybody, and when, when I find, we finally had a moment where a very good friend of mine, uh, a pastor I'd known for years, shot himself in the heart, left his family, and it was an eye-opener, awakening moment for me. And my friend and I were talking over the phone. I'm like, I'm not going to let that happen. He said, well, I'm here to make sure it doesn't happen to you, and I said, well, I'm here to make sure it doesn't happen to you. See, we finally got it out. We were talking to each other about what we were going through. No, we didn't stay there. We didn't stay in it. Yes, we knew that God's victory was for us, but there are times when even though you know that God wants you to overcome, you can be struggling. And you know what's just as bad as not telling someone? Fake faith. I got this when you don't got it. So we don't need to play games with that anymore because Satan lives there too in that faith, fake, fake faith realm, pretending that you're all that and uh, you don't have it. Confess it. Tell someone. You don't get there unless you have a relationship. Isolation is never where we need to be. Thirdly, you got to do what you got to do. Now, that's intentionally generic. Matthew 5, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. What's Jesus saying? I mean, we don't want a bunch of one-eyed. I don't want to come back next week and have everybody, you know, have your eye plucked out. It sounds funny, but what's he saying? You need to get radical, and you need to get rid of it. Whatever it is, it's causing you, and it's not the same. When I talk about impurity, it's not the same for every person. I don't know what your impurity is, but you do. I love this old story. It's humorous, but it, but it kind of gets the point across. There's a preacher that I listen to quite often who was a minister back in the 40s and 50s, and so he was having what they call an old-fashioned, well, it wasn't old-fashioned at the time, it was an altar service, where at the end of the service, they have everyone come to the altar and pray, and they have music going, and people are just kind of getting business taken care of with God. We don't do that that much anymore. But it doesn't mean people shouldn't take care of their business with God. And so that's what they were doing. He was walking around praying for people, and he heard this lady, she was a couple rows back, she had her head on the row in front of her, and she was just screaming, Oh, Jesus, you know I don't want to. Take it away from me, Lord. Oh, take it away from me, Lord. And he finally worked his way over to her and he said, Sister, what is it that you want the Lord to take away from you? Oh, 
oh, Jesus. And he said, just about that time, she lifted up and gave him a spit bath. He said, what is it? And she just had her eyes closed and was carrying on. He said, like a freight train through a tunnel. Finally grabbed her by the shoulders and said, shut up. Can't do that now, nowadays. He said, what is it? Whoops. That you want to get rid of? She said, that old snuff. She's dipping the snuff. He said, sister, Jesus isn't going to take snuff away from you. He said, you cut it off. If it's causing you to sin, you get rid of it. He said, he'll heal the wound, but you need to cut it off. Jesus isn't going to do it for you. And that's still the same today. God isn't going to take something away from you. You have to do it. And you know what she told him? She said, well, I, just, I can't give up snuff. See, she was not accepting responsibility from the Lord to take care of something herself. You got to do what you got to do. If it's tell somebody, tell somebody. If it's confess, it's confess. Whoever it may be. And we're going to give you an opportunity at the end of the service to take care of between you and God because we don't want to leave you. The last thing we need to do is fill our life. This is where we get to the good stuff. You ready for the good stuff? Everybody ready for the good stuff? Three people are ready for the good stuff. I don't know. The... <laughs> we need to fill our life with God. Finally, we need to fill our life with God. See, the Bible, Jesus told a story about a, a spirit that was cast out of a man. And he said, when the spirit left, he went out through dry places, and he's like, well, I'm going to go back and see what's going on where I used to live. And he, Jesus tells the story. He said the spirit finds his, the house, meaning the man and the, his life and his body, swept and clean. There's nothing in it. It's all empty. See, this is, this is a life of, of focusing on what you don't want to do. Anyone ever been there? I'm never going to do that again. I'm never going to do that. I'm never going to do that. Constantly focused on what not to do. We don't need to be doing that. You need to be filling your life with God. I'm just going to give you a couple scriptures. Number one, Colossians 1.13. God has rescued, delivered, translated us out of the kingdom of darkness. He's pulled you out of there, and now he's moved you into the kingdom of the son of his love. That's a scripture every one of us need to memorize. I have been removed from out from under the authority of darkness, and I am now in the light. I'm in the kingdom of the Son of His love. Sin is no longer my master. It says that in Romans 6, 14. Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Sin shall not be your master. He said, don't yield yourself. Don't give in to sin. Don't give the devil any place. He's telling you, that you have the right to resist sin. Can you see how confused people would be if they're told they're sinners all the time when sin comes knocking at the door and you think you're a sinner? You'd be like, well, I guess I'm going to sin then. I really have no option here. But that's not true. What's true is you've been pulled out. You're no longer a sinner. You have the Holy Spirit of the living God who has given you authority over sin. That's what set Jesus' teaching apart from the Pharisees. See, the devil will, will uh, have people go to church. I don't know. It happens every Sunday all over the world. Satan sends people to church. And so when, when, the, when, the, when the devils and these people would go to the church in the synagogues and the Pharisees were teaching, we don't know what they did. We never found out. But they must not have done what Jesus did because when the devil showed up at Jesus' meetings and he, they tried to disrupt it, he said, shut up and come out. And that's what happened. They shut up and they came out. And so people went, wait a minute, what's going on with this guy that makes when people, he says, shut up, come out. All of a sudden these people are acting differently. No one's done that before. Because he had authority, and that's the same authority that you have. 
When you've been pulled out of the kingdom of darkness and you are living in the kingdom of the son of his love, you have authority. And walking morally pure puts you in a situation where you are bold when it comes to the devil. When you're living in sin and just living a forgiven life, Satan can go, what about this? Well, what about that? What about that? And you won't even deal with, with Satan. He'll be like, yeah, 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 and telling you all the stuff you've done wrong. But when you're pure and you're living right, and you, when he comes knocking at your door and says, listen, I got something for you. This is going to happen to you. You're like, oh, no, sir. Not me. Sin shall not have dominion over me. I'm not giving into that anymore. I don't live that life anymore. That's not me. You're not going to trick me, devil. I'm not going to keep my head down fighting with another brother and sister in Christ. I'm going to put my head up, and I'm going to see you coming from a far away, and I'm out of there. Sometimes you just need to run. When sin comes knocking, you run. It's called the way of escape in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. How many of you are with me this morning? You got to run like Joseph did. We got to fill our lives with God. God has given us authority to live victorious over sin. You see, God will put his finger on an area in your life. It's not the same for everyone, and we're not all on the same path. We're not all working or dealing with the same thing. God doesn't have his finger on the same area of everyone's life. You understand what I'm saying? You got to do what God's got you doing and walk that walk. And don't feel guilty or condemned because you've missed it because your life will become a way and a testimony for someone that's living in that. You can say, I was there and now I'm out of that. And when people know you and they know what you were like, or you can tell them what you were like, and you can say, I'm free now. That's something that they can hold on to. That's something that they can see. That's something that's real. That's something they can go, yeah, I want that. But when we're just as messed up as the rest of the world, it's difficult to really tell them about how good Jesus is. He is good. But is it, it's better when he's, we're experiencing his goodness and we can share with them how he helped us overcome. Y'all good? I know we, we've been, like I told you, we were going to light it up this morning. <laughs> Listen, before we finish, I just want to give you an opportunity. I want to pray a prayer with those. Well, I'm just going to have everyone um, repeat it in the room because I know better than to try to have people raise their hands and feel condemned because I know how Satan works. I've been in services where they were talking about wrongdoing and all that and people are like feeling bad and then, you know, uh, embarrassed and Satan's like, oh man, if you raise your hand, you're going to be embarrassed. Sometimes you need to just stand up and be bold and, and, and admit it. But there's also sometimes that someone... If they lead you in a prayer, you can say that prayer from your heart. You mean it. God's listening and the devil's listening. This morning, right now. So let's just say it together. I want everyone to repeat it after me. God, I'm turning my back on any kind of sin. I'm going to live holy. Forgive me for anything in my life that doesn't please you. I'm changing. I'm walking in a new direction. You said in your word that sin shall not have dominion over me. So I say to you this morning, sin, you are not my master. Jesus is my master. I refuse to sin. I'm going to live holy. In Jesus' name, Satan, in the name of Jesus Christ, I break your power over my life. I refuse to submit to you anymore. 